Well, hello everybody, welcome to Red Tool House. I'm Troy, and if you've been in the homesteading circles for any time at all, you're probably familiar with the term biochar. We know biochar is a great additive when mixed into our composting for building garden soils. But are there income opportunities and carbon emission reduction opportunities with biochar? Well, before I answer those questions, let's make sure we all have a general understanding of biochar. So what is biochar? Well, biochar is just simply charcoal. It is a piece of wood. This is actually a piece of shag bark hickory. It's a piece of wood burned to the point that all that's left is carbon, but not burned to the extent that it's just reduced to ash. So it's carbon in suspension we have right here. So why is biochar so beneficial to the soil? Well, if you look, if we look closely at this chunk of biochar, you'd see with the cracks and the crevices, there's just tons and tons of surface area. In fact, it's reported that a handful of biochar has as much surface area as a football field. Well, why does that matter? Well, when incorporated into a nutrient-rich area, let's say a, a compost tea or a high manure area from chickens or pigs or what have you, then all of that's going to get soaked up into the biochar because it acts like a sponge, but then the bacteria in the mycelial network can use all of that surface area to kind of hang out there and attach. So it kind of becomes this awesome little life raft of nutrient that can then be placed in your soil, in your garden soil, and all that slowly gets released over time, providing benefit to your garden. So what about those other benefits? Well, recently I attended a biochar seminar put on by our local extension service in cooperation with our capital conservation district. And they did a seminar discussing biochar as well as had a biochar creation demo, an actual burn. The presentation was made by Kelpie Wilson. She is the founder of Wilson Biochar. And she's a, a, a known expert in biochar, been dealing with this in the early 2000s. So she did this presentation talking about the benefits of biochar and really got in deep into the science behind it. Recently, after the presentation, I invited her here to Red Toolhouse virtually, and we sat down and had a discussion and took a deeper dive into the mechanics of biochar. I first found out about biochar in 2006. The charcoal, you know, the biochar um, was a new idea to, to me and almost everybody um, in the West. So I got very excited about it. My first thought about it was, Hey, wow, that sounds like permanent compost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know how your garden beds every year just kind of shrink? You know, you'll put compost and, you know, manure and everything in your garden beds. And then at the end of the season, it's shrunk because right. the plants have just consumed. Well, you know, all that carbon's been consumed, actually, not by the plants, but by the microbes. And it's, and so you have to go do the whole thing again, you know, haul manure, make, you know, throw compost in there you know, bring soil from outside, you know, whatever you need to do. And so um, to me, a labor saving, as a labor saving device, that really interested me. And so I just started delving into it. And I was doing some freelance writing for a yoga magazine at the time, doing environmental column for them. And I said, send me to this conference. There's the first ever biochar conference in Australia in 2007. And they said, well, we'll pay you for your article, you know, and that was enough to cover my travel. Yeah, cool. And I had to go to Australia and meet like the first movers and shakers, you know, soil science, PhD soil scientists who were uh, involved in trying to figure this out, what was making it work. I asked Kelpie, why should a homesteader or small farmer be interested in biochar or in biochar production on their property? You know, a, a number of reasons. I think the main reason is for composting and managing your waste and closing that nutrient cycle. So, you know, you bring in inputs and every time you bring something in, it costs money. Even if you, if it's free, you have to pay, you have to go get it, cost you gas, whatever, um, and time. And so the more you can have a closed system, the better off you're gonna be time-wise and money-wise. And so biochar is, is something that really helps you manage waste and convert it into um, nutrients for soil and plants. And uh, so I think that's the, the kind of the value of it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of kind of cascading benefits. 
So for instance, can I talk about your situation? Because I watched one of your videos the other sure, day. Sure, please do. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, this was one of your videos where you had your 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 piglets or um, I guess it was actually the the chickens you had on a piece of ground over the winter. You mm -hmm. had the chicken yeah. coop on a piece of ground. Yes. Yeah. And you had put wood chips down. This is the one about wood chips. Mm -hmm. And then the, they were, you know, doing their thing on it all winter. And that was mixing with the wood chips. And you noticed, hey, this lo this loosened up the clay soil. You know, this was a good thing. You know, so it's like in permaculture, you talk about stacking functions, mm -hmm. yep. right? Right. And um, so it's the same kind of idea where you, you so you take you've got wood waste. What are you going to do with it? You could chip it. And that's great, you know, and you can get chips easily. And there's a definitely a role for chips. Or you could turn it to biochar. Mm -hmm. And how is biochar different from chips? Well, it's not always either or, it's both and. Right. So um, the chips will break down. The biochar has different properties. It has much more surface area than a wood chip. And so it holds air and water. And so if the, you have your coop on, the, on a layer of biochar, or maybe biochar and chips, then um, you know the biochar is going to absorb the nitrogen a lot better than the chips will, mm -hmm. and so it'll keep that nitrogen in place. And then the chips will provide some degradable carbon. So the char is almost like the matrix that holds it there with the air and water. And then you've got the degradable carbon. You've got the nitrogen coming down from the animals, and then you've got everything you need for a good compost, right? Carbon, nitrogen, aeration and moisture and a lot and you don't really have to do much right you just put it out there let the birds do their thing let them scratch it in um or the or the piglets whatever the animals are and you know at the end of the season you've got compost already done mm -hmm. you don't have to like pile it and turn it and do all this stuff to it so when i asked her about income opportunities with biochar here's what she had to say yeah, there there really is. So I think there's two things to think about. One is a biochar as a service model. So we've got quite a few people now here on the West Coast for contractors, arborists, you know, people who are doing forestry work, um, vegetation management, who have ring of fire kilns, and they can show up to a job and they can, um, you know, do all the cutting. And then, you know, uh, instead of just burning it in piles, they can make biochar for the customer. So I've got, there's a, a company in um, in California now working for the wine industry where they're showing up and they're basically, the vines have already been pulled. So it's usually old vineyard renewals. And they're, they're just, they're these giant burn piles. And instead of lighting them off, this company comes, turns it into biochar and then sells the biochar to the winery. And, and it's valued, you know, it's, it's highly valued. So that they, they, they're doing pretty well with that. Um, or you could, you know, there's other people who are working just for other kinds of customers, like small woodland owners. I mean, we have 10,000 small woodland owners in Oregon that have five to 40 acres of, of forest, and it's a lot to manage that. So helping people manage their, their forestry waste and, um, the biochar is, is something that's, that's valued by the customer. Um, and the other way that I recommend for people who have small farms, especially if you have livestock and you have a lot of manure, um, and there is to make a value added product. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can make biochar, but how do you sell biochar? You know, people, I know some people that try to sell a little bag of it at the farmer's market and they probably sell a few little bags like that, but you know, still a lot of people don't really know how to use it. Right. right. But you can make something like, for instance, a, a vermicompost. So take some of your pig manure and your and some biochar and put some worms in it and make a really rich vermicompost with biochar in it. And, you know, that kind of stuff can sell for a couple hundred dollars a cubic yard, mm -hmm. you know, and people will value it because it's, it's really a good fertilizer. And one of the things that intrigues me the most was this question, how is government getting involved and how are they looking at biochar right now? Do they have an environmental interest? Well, that whole landscape of carbon credits is really incredibly complicated because there's there's um, what's called a compliance market where people are required 
to buy carbon credits, mm -hmm. it doesn't really exist yet. It's really more of a voluntary market, but there's, you know, but there's more and more pressure on some of these big corporations to do something. So there is more funding coming for that. And um, there's protocols available now for biochar and they're mostly focused on, you know, bigger companies that are making a lot of it. And, you know, some, some, you know, big fortune 500 company like Microsoft or something wants to buy their carbon, um, they're called carbon removal credits. Mm. And so, you know, there's big, big companies that will buy those and then they can put in their annual reports, whatever, you know, we, we remove so much carbon from the atmosphere this year. So um, that's one pathway, but we're actually a couple of protocols now being developed for smaller projects. Mm. And of course, this is a lot more difficult because of the tra what, transaction costs, right? Because you've got to document what you do right. and you, and then you have to have somebody verify it and say, yes, they actually did this. Um, but um, we're actually making a lot of progress right now. I'm working with a group in South Africa where they have a lot of similar problems with forest fires and, you know, um, a lot of woody waste and woody debris. And so anyway, just a young group of young folks there who've developed all this stuff and with blockchain and all this stuff that I know nothing about. <laughs> but, um, and I've reviewed their protocol just in terms of the feasibility and the reality of it. And it's really good. And so we're starting to roll that out and we're gonna be actually um, uh, starting a beta testing program. And it's very much tied to the Ring of Fire Kiln because it's so easy to monitor and measure what we're doing in the Ring of Fire Kiln. So mm -hmm. we have a whole little, there's a phone app and it's pretty easy. So if you're a contractor and you have a Ring of Fire Kiln and you're gonna use it you know, 40, 50 days a year, it'd be worth it to you because what you can do is you, you start your burn, you take some pictures of the feedstock, you do some moisture measurements in the feedstocks. We know you're not trying to burn wet wood because that'll emit more methane and methane is a greenhouse gas. So we have little controls like that. You know, your feedstock moisture is good. You take a picture of the flame. So we know that it was flaming. Flaming combustion is very different than smoldering combustion. It's much cleaner. So you have a few pictures of the burn throughout. And then at the end, um, you just smooth the char out in the, in the kiln. It's a cylinder, right? So you just measure from the top how much there is and you know how much you made. Yeah. And so from that, we, you know, using a few different kind of safety factors, conservative, you know, factors, you know, for um, the bulk density and the carbon content and so forth, we can, the app can return you uh, a figure that said, yes, you sequestered two tons of CO2 today with the, the char that you made in the ring of fire kiln. And then, you know, you're, you'll accumulate that over a season. And at the end of the season, um, the, the, the platform will help connect you with a buyer mm -hmm. and you might get $200 a batch of char or something like that. You know, uh, it, it would, it would help. Right. Yeah. So and, you, and, and we, we get to keep the char, right. We're not having to ship it anywhere. No, no, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. well, that's great. As a mechanical engineer, Kelpie designed and developed the Ring of Fire biochar kiln. This kiln quickly and efficiently produces biochar and it's portable. She explains the details of her design for us. Oh yeah, so I first started out making bin kilns that were um, like five feet across on top and four feet on the bottom, like a little a kind of uh, inverted pyramid shape, truncated inverted pyramid. And they work pretty nicely. They weigh 200 pounds a piece. So I had a trailer with a jib crane so I could lift them in and out. And it's just exhausting, you know, and I couldn't move one myself at all. And so I was like, I need to figure out the grandma way of doing this. <laughs> so I don't always need a crew of four hefty young men, you know, I want to be able to do it myself or with one other person. And so the ring of fire kiln is panels that bolt together and each panel is, the panels weigh less than 40 pounds a piece. So I can pick that up and carry it. And you just set it up and you bolt them together. And then there's a heat shield that goes around that. 
And the other thing I like about the Ring of Fire kiln is that the, the old bin kilns were only 24 inches high and they didn't have a heat shield. So whenever you had a fire in it, you were exposed mm. to the flame and the radiant heat. It would kind of cook you. Yeah. This one with the heat shield, it's, you're very protected from the heat. And so that's nice. But the panels are not only, you know, not that heavy. I could move them myself, but they fit in the, they could fit in the back of the station wagon. Right. So, yeah. Or just a, a small pickup truck. No problem. And I can stack like six of them in a, in a trailer. Yeah. So I could take a bunch of them out somewhere without, you know, very, very easy to transport. Well, you know, I was actually at a friend's house on Sunday and they had a bunch of work done by a, AmeriCorps crew, you know, uh, which is great because they had a lot of brush. So they had like maybe 10 big piles. And um, I pulled up, we got up the kiln, we settled, set it up. And normally they would have just lit those piles on fire. And um, I mean, I'm kind of going to go into a few different benefits here of using sure. the kiln. And when you just light a, a, a burn pile on fire, it's going to burn really unevenly. You know, it's part, it might flame up for a bit and then it might like drop down and just smoke as the fire tries to kind of move around the pile. And, and you know, you'll kind of try to chunk it in a little bit. And um, you can make biochar from a burn pile like that if you just wait till it's burnt down to that glowing coal stage and you put it out. You're going to get a, a, more ash and you won't get as much char because it's just one pile. So what we did, we set up the kiln and we load it up and we light it on top. And because all the air comes from the top, there's no air coming from the sides or the bottom. It concentrates the heat. And so it keeps the flame going. And one of the things that does is it, the process goes a lot quicker because when in a regular burn pile, it, you know, like I said, it burns unevenly, it smolders for a while and smokes and it just, it, it's cool. You have nothing to hold the heat in, so it takes a lot longer mm -hmm. to process the wood. So, you know, in like in three hours, we we consumed like five of these big piles, and we ended up with a kiln full of, of char. And so it's really by concentrating the heat and controlling the airflow, that's how you improve the efficiency of it. And, and you get your work done quicker, too. Kelpie also mentioned that the NRCS is providing some funding for biochar production and biochar usage. So in addition to the potential for getting carbon credits to help pay for this, in addition to the potential of making a value added product that you could sell, um, you could also get um, NRCS payments through two different programs that they're rolling out right now. Um, not all states have them fully developed, but you know, it's, it's, it's on its way. One is a payment for adding biochar to your soil. Hmm. So um, it's, several hundred dollars an acre to purchase and apply biochar or biochar compost. And there's no reason why you can't make your own. Um, and so, you know, if you're working, already working with NRCS, ask them about that because you oh, might be able to get some additional cost share help with that. And then there's another program that they have, which is just for the, uh, it's the, it's part of the conservation stewardship program. So it's a little bit more of an involved application process but they will actually pay you to make biochar from woody debris. So again, a cost share program. Yeah. And that came out of some work we did with a conservation innovation grant. We are looking heavily into biochar production here at Red Toolhouse, simply because we have 100 acres of Appalachian hardwood that the waste wood is falling around us as we speak. And also with a sawmill, we have a lot of byproduct there that we could easily get into biochar production with not too many inputs. Now, I spent a full hour just in the discussion with Kelpie, and of course didn't include that in this video. But if you'd like to see the full discussion, make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter. The link will be below in the video description, and I will post a link to that full interview so you can get all the details that we skipped over in this video. Also, be sure to check out Kelpie's resources that I'll link below as well as her Ring of Fire Kiln website, which will also be in the video description. Well, I appreciate everybody watching. Comment below and let me know how you use biochar or if you've considered it yet. All right, take care.